Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. I'm ecstatic beyond belief to be joined by the Scott Twins, better known as The Whispers, 15 top 10 R&B singles, eight top 10 R&B albums, two of which reached number one. Gentlemen, brothers, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having Thank us. You for yeah. having Thank us, you very friend. much. Absolutely, yeah. the history, it's just more than 50 years in the business. I'm just, I'm in awe. <laughs> Thank you. So I wanna kinda go back in time and try to picture us in Watts, in the time that you were growing up in the 60s. What, what was that like, just, just growing up in your childhood? It was very exciting. If you remember, the 60s um, was the, uh, I guess Motown was in its heyday. Yes. So we weren't any different than most young people that wanted to be in entertainment. We wanted to be like the Motown. Right. Uh, the Temptations, the yeah. Four Tops, and of course in Watts, where we lived, uh, there was a talent show that was held every year that we entered mm -hmm. uh, as the Scott Twins. Mm. This is before the Whispers were, were formed. Right. And um, one night on one of those talent shows, we met the three other guys who would later become members of the Whispers. Yeah. And that's kind of how the Whispers got started sure. in, in Watts, you know, right, back right. in the early 60s. Right, and you heard them singing and said, okay, maybe, yeah, they, maybe, yeah. maybe they can join so us. You, you were there, this is a great five man because there's two of us and three of them. Yes. So it made a perfect five stand-up vocal group. So we said, hey, after we leave here tonight, let's, let's put it together. And sure. that's how it started. Absolutely. And I want to talk about some of the elements that make the group so unique in, in that sound by talking about your father and including jazz and bebop that we just can't get enough of. Our dreams were answered later on with R&B, but my father was what I call a bebop guy. Mm. You, you might have heard that term before, yes. but back in the day, that's what he really wanted us to do. Mm. And he, he bought me a set of drums, he right. bought him a saxophone that we ended up later tearing up and not even, oh. <laughs> not, you know. But his dream for us was to sing bebop. Yes. And we did learn it, but mm -hmm. once we heard R&B, mm -hmm. we sort of switched and went in another direction. And if you listen to our music even today, right. you hear bits and pieces yes. of, because it's you, once it's in you, it's just there. We loved it, but we later found out as much as we loved it, we could make more money doing it than doing, <laughs> right. doing the other. And was that the big driver with the interest in R&B, or was it just sort of, it was coming along and you all wanted to jump on that train? It came along, and we happened, you know, at that stage of our lives, R&B was kind of taking over. You know, mm -hmm. my dad was into Miles Davis, yes. and you know, he liked the scat, Yes. but R&B was taking over. You mm -hmm. know, in, in the 60s, it, whether you couldn't stop it, so we were, being the age that we were, we migrated into it just like everybody else, you know? and. Mm -hmm against our, because my father fought hard. He yes. thought R&B was kind of like nothing. Right, right, <laughs> you know? right, right. If you didn't sing jazz, you weren't legitimate. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Interesting. So we had to really kind of force him to like R&B. Right. And uh, when we formed the group, 
uh, we it evolved from there. You know, it was like everybody else. We wanted to be like the Temptations. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And on that element, here's another difference too. Not really having a base, you all were really able to find this niche. A little bit of the jazz, the bebop, and also yeah. sort of more ballad and not quite going for the bass. So it made yeah. you unique. You know, you sound like, uh, do you play an instrument? You sound like a musician. I sure. mean, yes, knowing that a lot of people don't realize you're right. We didn't. We were one of the few groups that didn't have that rolling bass. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to say to myself, what does the doctor know about it? <laughs> <laughs> the doctor talking about that bass was missing. You, you, you showing up something that maybe you don't want nobody to know about or whatever. Well, you so, know what? To be actually, see, groups like the High Lows, the Four mm -hmm. Freshmen, right. they were the pop jazz groups, mm -hmm. which is what my father liked. Yes. So we didn't have a bass, you know, mm -hmm. but we wanted to have a bass. You know, mm -hmm. we listened to Otis at the Temptations, sure, Jim Melvin. Sure, but we had to kind of bide our time between pleasing our father mm -hmm. and doing R&B. Right. So yeah, we had a group without a bass, you know, yeah. and it was, it was unusual because most R&B groups did have a bass. Yeah. Absolutely. Talk to us about just sort of getting started. It's still so hard today, but back then, hard to imagine coming from Watts and, like you said, competing, so to speak, with Motown. How did you all sort of get those first couple of breaks? I think it started right after the talent show because mm -hmm. my brother was, he was us being twins when he got drafted into the Army. The law was that you could only take one. You mm -hmm. couldn't take both. So I was left right. to, to keep the music going, and he was over in Vietnam. Right. And while he was in Vietnam, you know, we just sort of developed and developed and developed. Next thing you know, we got to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. We built our act up. And next thing you know, we were making a living at it. Yeah. <laughs> so by the time he came back, we we mm -hmm. put him in the group, but he was like, <laughs> in no yeah, man's left land. me behind. Wow, well, left him behind <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, no. I mean, no, I really couldn't keep up. I mean, they had they had evolved into a professional stand up vocal group. I think the years that I spent two years in Vietnam, but mm -hmm. those two years they were kind of paying their dues right. going all over the country. Mm -hmm. So when I got back to join this group, mm -hmm. uh, here I am. I didn't know how I thought I could perform right. until I got in front of an audience mm -hmm. and I found myself lost. Mm -hmm. And I went to my mom mm -hmm. and I said, you know, mom, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. Mm -hmm. So she went to him and she said, well, I'll tell you what, you tell your brother you better make it, because if he, you don't make it, he ain't going to make it. <laughs> so they kept me in the group, you know? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Tell us about that, though, during the time, because it's such a poignant point of being in Vietnam. I work with a lot of vets, and maybe how either music kept you going or the ways that you all literally did stay in touch, because you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. No, no, we had just wrote letters. Mm -hmm. I wrote to my mom. We had a, wrote to him a couple of times. But in Vietnam, I was listening to groups like The Intruders, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I Want to Know Your Name. Yes. And I was uh, in Vietnam uh, in the Central Highlands right. on guard duty listening to I'll Always Love My Mama. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, told, I, wrote, I wrote him and told him how it felt mm -hmm. to be in Vietnam listening to the, the impact of R&B went all over the world. Here I am in Vietnam and I couldn't wait to get back to start singing what I was listening to. It was just an incredible feeling. Yeah. Sure. Well, the other thing that makes you all so unique, I mean, there's so many elements, I hope we have time, is just being twins and the friendship and the relationship and the ups and downs, and I'm sure there have been some squabbles. How have you all mastered that? Because so many groups that are related, and certainly not twins, have imploded under the pressure. Well, we've been here, I'm, I'm shocked myself that we are here as long as we've been here. But we learned early age that you're only as strong as your weakest link. Mm -hmm. We were all, the two of us and the other guys, we were all raised by single mothers. Right. And to this day, I think that's what helped us the most. Mm -hmm. They put a, a sense of fair play in us. We mm -hmm. understood. They told us early, be what you are, not what you ain't. Right. Exactly. <laughs> what you ain't. That's <laughs> how they put it. Yeah. And that has stuck with us because a lot of people say, well, man, how would you guys make it doing to say, you know, we just stuck with R&B music. We knew that was the best that we could do, and that's what we stuck with. Yeah. And to this day, I believe that's why we're still here. Sure, absolutely. Talk to us about the relationship with Solar Records and how pivotal and instrumental that was, not only to your careers, but just to Los Angeles overall. That was probably the most exciting time of our career. Right. We met Mr. Dick Griffey, who had this dream. He kind of wanted to be like Barry Gordy in Motown. Right. And, and as you know, that he and Don Cornelius started out yes. with Soul Train Records, yes. 
and that didn't end up being yeah, <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah, you, you know the history, okay, you know, yeah. but when he formed the Solar, the Sound of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. it was just an exciting time because Dick Griffey had a great quality of letting young people mm -hmm. stretch out and be who they are, right. and in forming Solar Records, you know, we came in contact with Mr. Leon Silvers, yeah. who was in his prime as a producer, yeah. formerly of the Silvers. Yeah. We came in contact with Leon, and the next thing you know, we're making all of this beautiful music. Okay. He as a producer, right. getting out of us as vocalists what a producer can do. I mean, it was the most exciting thing that ever happened to us, and we watched this little small label mm -hmm. literally compete. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, Solar Records was, you know, we had big hits from right. Shalimar, yes. and Lakeside, right. and Whispers, and Dynasty. Right. It was very exciting, no question about it. Sure. It seems like Leon maybe was a beat machine or a beatbox before anybody could even understand that. What was it like watching him work and not think that he was literally crazy? <laughs> <laughs> he put it right, <laughs> just right. He, he was a man ahead of his time as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And while it might sound like I'm prejudiced, I think he was probably the greatest R&B producer that ever did it. Mm. Because what he did, everything else came behind him. Right. A lot of people copied him. You know, I, he changed our lives completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had all, we had been to the party. You know, what's the old saying? That we almost got there, but no cigar. Right. When Leon came, we got two or three cigars. Mm -hmm. When he went in and did And the Beat Goes On, right. we knew at the playback, that night right. that we'd had our first hit. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't, we knew when it was finished. Now, like you said, if watching him go through what he did, I remember seeing Leon oh, <laughs> on his knees doing, he was a drum machine before there was right. a drum, machine. drum machines. Right. And the, the, the incredible thing about him is that he knew what the outcome was gonna be, right. but sometimes we didn't. You didn't, mm -hmm. you no, did, until you know, he finished. Until mm -hmm. he finished, yeah. but when he did finish, Right. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah, he was a bass player. Mm -hmm. right? That's what he did and you know, with his group. Mm -hmm. But he had in his head, he knew what And The Beat was gonna sound like mm -hmm. before anybody else did. Right. And he wanted to put it together piece by piece. He would mm -hmm. start with the bass drum on right. his knees, right. hitting the bass so drum. Different. He'd come up to the tom-toms. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was gonna do with the cymbals. Right. And you'd be in the studio watching this and you said, this, is this guy crazy or what, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. When he finished with the entire thing that he had in his head, mm -hmm. what you heard was the biggest record that we ever had mm -hmm. in our lives. Absolutely. A two million seller. And did you expect it to ever go that big though? No. Because many no. times people no. say, no. okay, I know it's no. a good song. No, no, no we no. did not. I mean, no. And we can actually say to this day, mm -hmm. the biggest record we've had, as a matter of fact, from 1980, starting with Leon, right. up until about 88, everything we had was either gold or silver, right. or, you know, but it started with him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, we we don't we don't mind telling people we give him the full credit because he deserves it. He was a guy that was way ahead of everybody as far as I'm concerned. And behind him came Kashif, right. Evelyn Champagne, all these oh, yeah. sounds. All that these you sounds, heard. yeah, that's true. I don't want to use the word stole, but it sure. came it came <laughs> no, from no, he yeah. originated. It came no, from it Leon. really did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What are those elements, and maybe we can only identify one or two, that you think makes a song a hit? Just in your general sense, if you hear music and you go, I really think that song, before we were done with it, we knew it would be a hit. What yeah. do you think those elements are? Well, back then, we called it real, it was real easy. It was the hook line. Mm -hmm. They call it, you know, and the hook line is something, it's amazing how people unconsciously like something that they don't even know that they like. Right. They are attracted to that hook line because it goes over and over again. Sure. Leon knew mm -hmm. about the hook line okay. because uh, I never will forget when we did Hey Scotty, What's That Means, mm -hmm. the night that we came to the studio, right. Leo, Leon sat us down, he said, Scotty, I got this song and I want you, the one line in it says, I want you to shout, Hey Scotty, what that mean? <laughs> right. Scotty says, Leon, I'm not saying <laughs> that. Right, right, right. <laughs> There's no me. way am I going <laughs> to sing that line. Right. Well, Nick, the guy, the, the big guy in our group with the beard, he took Scotty outside, he said, Scotty, listen, this guy has brought us some tremendous hits. Right. You gotta give him an opportunity mm -hmm. to finish what he's trying to tell you. Sure. Well, if you know anything about the Whispers career, mm -hmm. uh, Hey Scotty, uh, yeah. Keep On Loving Me, mm -hmm. it's probably the third biggest hit that we ever had. Right. But this is what it was called, Hey Scotty, that was a hook line. Mm -hmm. 
And people didn't really know it, but that's what they latched on to, and that's what became one of our biggest hits of all time. Mm-hmm. Well, what I learned about Leon before, and a lot of singers go through this, the, mm-hmm. the, another thing that I think is so incredible about him, he made me understand truly what a producer is. Mm-hmm. Be- because before him, most singers, if you can sing, you figure, well, you know, I can sing, I don't need no, what do I need to produce for? What do right. you do? Yes. You know, that, right. that was exactly. <laughs> what is it you do do? Leon is the one that made me understand. I don't care how well you think you sing. Right. There's things that I'm going to bring to the table that you would never dream of. Sure. And he was excellent. He was the man that did that. And if you want to know the truth, because of him, I don't care who the producer is, how old or young, I fully respect sure. because they bring a whole other element. Sure. It has nothing to do with how well you sing. Right. It's about, you ask the question, where does it come from? The commercialism, having the pulse of the people, that's what the producers listen to. You listen to your voice, and you might be able to sing, but he brings all those other elements. And to me, he did that better than anybody else. Not just with the Whispers, as you know. I mean, Shalimar Shalimar, and his own group. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, at that time, he was developing himself because he was was so influenced by what was happening in Motown, but he took his little ideas from the Silvers, right. and they sang what we call like barbershop harmony. Right, right, exactly. right, right. <laughs> you know what right, I'm saying? Right. But he, he, he uplifted it and brought it to where people, all R&B guys all over this country exactly. were copying him. They wanted that sound. Exactly. Yeah. Being twins, talking about sounds and music, how do you all negotiate and decide who sings, you know, <laughs> the lead on a song? Well, used to go, that used without to be, it coming to blows. Yeah. So. Man, we could have won a Grammy. They should have had us on television because yeah. we argued a lot about, oh, about yeah. who was going to sing what. Yeah. But good, now here again, back to producers. Yeah. Leon was able to hear that half a step difference. He mm-hmm. sings a half a step higher than I do. Right. And Leon had the insight to understand that when we get into the songs, that bring about a highness about him. I want right. Scotty doing it. Mm-hmm. When we got something that's kind of mellow right. and smooth, I want you to do it mm-hmm. because he had listened to our voices. So we ended up settling for that. Mm-hmm. But like, for instance, when we first heard Lady, right. we fought over it. We, sure. <laughs> he wanted to do the lead and I wanted to do the lead, sure. you know? Yes. Well, we went in and Nick said, I'll tell you what, Walt, mm-hmm. give Scotty a shot. I think this is in his vein. Mm-hmm. He ended up doing Lady in one take. Mm -hmm. Now we came back and we did other takes, but we kept the first take. And to show you what producing is all about, they were right. Right. As much as I wanted to do the lead, when I heard his lead, the playback, I said, I can't mess with that. You know, that's that's how it goes. Absolutely. This seems to be another element of the success. Sublimating ego, putting it down, not bringing it to blows, not bringing it to a gunfight or even something worse. And where do you think that comes from? You just said one word that I latch on to with singers, entertainers, and producers. Ego, Mm -hmm. ego. Mm -hmm. Did you ever notice that sometimes the bigger an an artist gets, the more unsuccessful they become Mm -hmm. because of one reason, ego. Mm -hmm. You have to be humble enough to go in and let a guy tell you that as well as you can sing, mm-hmm. I see something that you don't see within your vocals. And I hear something. Now your you ego will yeah. either allow you to say, wait a minute, I mean, I'm, right. I'm a bad, I sure. don't need that. <laughs> or your ego will have you with the humility to say he's right. Mm-hmm. That's what we never had a problem with. Sure. We never had a problem with taking direction. Right. Uh, Babyface, L.A. Reid, they right. were young enough to be our kids. Right. We had no problem listening to what they wanted to do. Yeah. And when they came within the mood, the rest is history. Right. That was one of the biggest hits we ever had. And not yeah. only that, we had no problem with knowing how, well, they later became huge, but yeah. even that didn't have, the same our success. thing was that, matter of fact, we would have rather dealt with somebody who was unknown. Right. Because that way you have to come in throwing your credentials, if you right. know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. you, we, we can deal with the talent that you bring and forget about how big or small you are. Or how many right. hits you've had. Many hits right. you've right. had. You we know what I'm saying? Yeah. That problem. yeah, sure. No. And let's talk about him. So he comes in very unassuming. Uh, Deal won't take his music for the most part because he really writes ballads. Yeah. And just talk to us about that relationship and how it unfolded with Babyface. We met L.A. and... and uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny, well, mm-hmm. Kenny, Kenny Edmonds is what he was known, and but L.A. Reid. We met mm-hmm. them in Atlanta at the, the yearly convention down there, mm-hmm. 
And they approached us, mm -hmm. and Kenny literally, literally said to us, you know, guys, you know, the deal of the group that I'm in, they all want to be Prince. So the songs <laughs> right. that, I, that I submit, they don't like. Right. Right. So would you guys take a listen to some of these songs? Yes. Man, now we're in Atlanta. This is right. years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These guys started playing songs. We went back to Los Angeles. We told Dick Griffey, mm -hmm. there's a young couple out here two young producers mm -hmm. named Kenny Edmond and L.A. Reid, mm -hmm. as soon as you can, go find them and sign them. Mm -hmm. Wow. And the rest is history. Work. These guys were young. Yes. They had their own ideas. And it just so happened for us that the way Kenny wrote was more for us than Kenny it was Edmund for the deal. The deal didn't right. want yeah, in the move. No, exactly. <laughs> right, right. They, 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 can you no, believe that? No, right. They, 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 they all wanted to be Prince. They, they all wanted to wear makeup. makeup right. They all wanted to do Prince style music. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, being a so clone, basically. We, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. So it just so happened. It just it just shows you how things go because we went in the studio with these guys, and man, we were just a perfect match. Kenny wrote what we were feeling, mm -hmm, and we mm -hmm. sang the way the way he wanted it done. Right. Well, so, there's a story that I have to tell you about mm -hmm. Kenny in particular because okay. we always talk about this, and, and we wonder. We went to him one night, and we said, "Kenny, what we need is another and the beat goes on," which right. is what Beyonce Silvers did, right? Sure. The biggest record we ever had. And he says to us, and I, I know it sounds like exaggeration, but he said. Okay, well, I'll bring you one back tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow night. Right. Like Every that. Day. Well, so Lavelle, you, Lavelle said, you Lavelle know, these young guys, he's going to bring us a hit. Like, and the beat tomorrow to night. Back so tomorrow, we laughed. You know, you know? And, and they what, young, you know, that's what they right. thinking. Well, first of all, they didn't right. understand. When you talk about a hit, you know, it was like a double respect, platinum record. You know? All those kind of records, you know, you know, you only hear one of them. You don't hear no two respects. No, right. You don't hear no two and the beats. No, right, exactly. So when he said he would bring back another and the beat, we said, in a day. We said, oh, great, man. <laughs> Just bring it on back. You'll be happy when you get here, right? right? Lo and behold, he came back the next night, right. and he had rock steady. Right. Amazing. Stunned us. Sure. It just, and we said, wait a minute. This can't be real. <laughs> Second biggest record we've ever had. Right. He listened to And the Beat, right. and he gave you his rendition. Mm -hmm. Now, that shows you how incredible... I don't know if he understood how bad he was, <laughs> right, right. you know, but he didn't. Now, that's never happened again. You know, that every now and then, right. a little jewel <laughs> would jump right, out. Pearl. But yeah. when he said he'd bring back another and a beat and he brought back the rock steady, the, the rest he history. pretty much did that. Yeah, that's sure. exactly what yeah. he did. Right. Yeah. And that seems to be that this yet another element yeah. of being willing to work with younger people, that's and exactly right. with the yeah. ego side, being that's willing exactly to right. take a chance that's where right. somebody else may not have, and also just continuing to have that sound. Absolutely. On that note, um, I want to bring up remastering and the fact that you all are redoing your entire catalog. Tell us how important it is for artists to do that and what it means. Well, oh. before we answer that, though, let me say to you in particular, sure. my friend, we want to thank you sincerely sure. for giving us this platform to talk about what we're getting ready to talk. Sure. It is very important. You didn't have to do this. Sure. We don't take it for granted. We appreciate it. You given us this this to talk about redoing our masses. We're in the process of redoing our masses. Simply put, now you might get different opinions. We both have different opinions about how it should go. But the question might be asked: Well, why are you at this late date even redoing your masses? It's because we now at this point we would like to get some of the benefits that other companies right. got through thievery years ago. Sure. <laughs> I don't know no other call way to put it, is. call it what it is. Yes. Well, you we know. differ. That's why he said he's well, we differ. Scotty's yeah. pretty brutal I, I, when I, it comes I, I, to I don't know no, I don't know no one, one way to talk and it's just Honest. say what you feel. You know, I'm not trying to sugarcoat <laughs> it. But we shouldn't have to redo. We shouldn't even be have to. We've been singing 54 years. Right. And we find here, we are, thank God, we are still able vocally to go right. back and redo. But if they hadn't been taken in the first, we wouldn't have had to go through this. Sure. So this young people need to understand this even more so than us. It's very important that you know that you can do this. Right. This is about ownership is right. what we're talking about. Sure. And Well, uh, it didn't come right away. There's a statute of limitations. Of it, mm -hmm. But after so many years, you can own what you've recorded. Right. And where we differ at is that I think young people, they are at that stage. We learn from them. Mm -hmm. As I think that what the rappers did, I, I admire so much what they did 
when they were before hip hop got to be like it is today, what the rappers basically said to the record companies is before we let you take advantage of us, right. we'll sell our product out of the trunk of our car. Right. Because they believe so much in ownership. Right. When we came up 50 years ago, we didn't have the opportunity. You right. had no clout. Right. You know, it took James Brown and Chuck Berry and Little right. Richard. When I heard that they gave James Brown $63 million, I said, man, they owe him four times right. that. Right. Sure. Right. Because they took advantage, he didn't have the advantage of owning. Ray Charles later, in some years later, was able right. to own his product. Sure. And he did it before anybody could he do it. He's the only one that you know, did it. He, he yeah. just told Atlantic, I'm not giving you my music. If right. I can't own it, I'm not going to record it. Right. Well, we were around at that time, too. Yeah. I mean, the temptation, all of Motown, Barry Gordy, God bless him. Yeah. But when you own it, right. now you decide mm -hmm. who can hear it and how it's played and what it's paid and what's paid for it. And who right. can benefit from it. And who can right. benefit yeah. from it. So, to have, thank God, we still, I can sing like I did at 19. Right, right. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so we can own our stuff now. Right. And when corporations and companies want to ha have music for television, they can come to us now, right, right, right. not the record company. Sure. What, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a joy that is to be able to have that ownership. And we, like he said, we said to all young people, if you can own it from the very beginning, own it. Sure. That's where the money is. Right. Ownership means everything. Right. And we're in a position to where we can own our catalog, and that's what we're doing. Right. And it sounds like the difference of that could literally be between getting nothing, even though the song's played all Absolutely. the time and popular, exactly. and Absolutely. actually being able to make a living Absolutely. and survive. Exactly. And make a tremendous living, because now we're not talking domestic. We're right. talking worldwide. worldwide. Right. So right. when you hear And The Beat Goes On in right. Germany, right. You know, and they have to go to Canada who owns the rights. Mm. Now, they can come to us. Right. You come to the Whispers to get sure. And The Beat. If you want a television commercial with And The right. Beat and you want to negotiate with somebody, sure. talk to us. Right. Man, I mean, what an asset. Sure. You know, we're just thankful that we're able to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, if I understand correctly, Anita Baker was sort of... Um, she did the same thing. Uh, right. All A lot of the white artists. Kelly like Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson. Uh, they all they're understand all it now, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, record companies, they mean well and they do well, mm -hmm. but they are used to having all the power right. from, the, wow. from the inception. They mm -hmm. owned everything. Well, now you take guys our age, mm -hmm. I mean, we were just glad to be on record. Sure. You know, and we would right. tell young people all the time, you know, no, don't give me some tennis shoes. Right. I, you know, don't, be, don't give me 3%. Right. You know, I want to know if the company grows 10 million, how much of that is fairly belongs to me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Right. So well, see, he, he, when he makes it, see that's what we did. He says that the record companies mean well. No, they don't. Mm -hmm. In my humble opinion, because yeah. wow. if they did, we wouldn't have this problem in the first place. But like he said, I do want to say to young people, because he just said something. I think that the young people need to. Your priorities do need to change. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be a tennis shoe. Right. It should be the recordings. Mm -hmm. You understand? Take learn that's from us. If you don't learn anything. Right. Your priority should be owning your, and I hate to say this, especially black acts. Sure. You need to own your own product. Right. Yeah. Because if you don't, <laughs> believe me, right. somebody else will take it right away from you. Yeah. yeah. And, absolutely. And, and really profit in a way. Oh, yeah, that absolutely. In ways it's un unbelievable. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Tell us about how busy you all still keep at this point in your lives, because I know you all were kind with your time to fit us in today and things like ah, that. Man. I, oh, you know what? We just say this. What a blessing. Yeah. We tour about eight months right. out of the year. And uh, to be in your 70s, right. you know, Dick Griffey, before he died, we were at a deposition when he was, we left Solar and he was trying to keep us. Right. And he said something at a deposition one day. He to told the, the lawyer to the judge, we were in there discussing why we should leave Solar. Right. And Dick Griffey said, no, I want to keep these guys. And the judge said, well, what is it? Why are you working so well? Why can't they have their freedom? Right. And Dick Griffey said to that guy, he said, you know what, these guys are going to be singing until they're 80 years old, mm -hmm. and I want to have every okay. dime of that wow. money that I can get. Wow. and he said that. And he is absolutely right. Who well, we in the world? Crazy. We thought he was crazy well, at the time. Yeah, sure. yeah. But here we are, you know, in our 70s, still singing. So all praises to the man upstairs. Sure. And you said us making time for you. Sure. No, we're still <laughs> no, we make it time. <laughs> no, we this, appreciate this you, man. This platform you've given us to yeah. discuss what we've just discussed. Sure. I can't say thank you enough. Yeah. Sure. Well, just one of those last elements to tease out, and you guys have been kind with your time. 
really making good quality music, lyrics, and the ability for it to last. Do you think that we're now really seeing a significant resurgence in the quality of the type of music that you all make? I do. I think just like when we came along, there was some that wasn't that great, but there was some that was great. The young people today, oh man, I mean, listen, <laughs> Bruno Mars, right. you know, uh, John Beyonce, Legend. John Legend, the, I mean, these young people are intelligent. Sure. They're articulate. They can express themselves and they understand the business. Right. They've come so much further than we could ever do because we didn't have the clout at yeah. the time. Yeah. I'm very proud of the young people that mm -hmm. perform today. Hip hop, the only thing I wish is that hip hop would understand that there's room for both of us. Sure. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. room for R&B and yeah. there's room for hip hop. Exactly. We just were at Microsoft a week ago right. and it was sold out. So yeah. R&B music is still <laughs> alive and well and so is hip hop. Right. But man, what a blessing it is. The music is being written, in my opinion, extremely well. Mm -hmm. The lyrics, right. we were blessed to have Nicholas Caldwell, who yeah. we lost in 2016. He was the only writer in our group. Mm -hmm. But man, you know, we, the baby faces, the yeah. midnight stars that we work with, we always emphasize good lyrics. Yes. And I just, I know that that's why our stand part, the longevity that we, it's because of what we sing as well as how we sing it. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it was so relatable and clean oh. and passionate. And <laughs> absolutely, lovely, man. And absolutely. Respectful. And respectful. Yeah. Always respect our ladies, our yes. moms, our sisters. Just, oh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. No absolutely. question. Sure. Last question, I promise. Um, the show is called Music and Medicine. When you hear that, each one of you, what does that mean to you? Well, when you say medicine, I think of us as being blessed. Uh, we had the good fortune, we've never smoked never drank, no drugs. And the only reason I think that we're here, you know, I'm 77 years old. Wow. And I know I'm blessed. Sure. You know, uh, I take one high blood pressure medical. That's right, it right, right. in terms of medicine. Right. But I feel like I'm blessed, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you well, me, that. when I first heard that we were doing this, they said music and medicine. <laughs> yeah. And then I found out you're a doctor. Right? And, <laughs> and, and, and now, through true. this interview, I think you probably really are a musician. There's music there somewhere. So I, I, I don't, I don't want to turn the question sure. around, Rumble. but I'm, I got to ask sure. you. How did you come up with the concept? Sure. Well, I was a musician, at least as classically. So <laughs> okay. you, your ear is accurate, but uh, nowhere near singing or any of the type so of So you see things. artists and musicians when it comes to medicine. Right. You know, in our industry, a lot of people don't take care of themselves. Right, exactly. They just don't. You know, yeah. I mean, I, to, right today, we do concert with groups that came up with us. Yeah. And you can see, man, from exactly. a medical standpoint, that they, they haven't taken... You can't smoke drugs, no. you know, for 20 years and think right. you can still do. You have to take care of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure you stress that. Sure, absolutely. When you, when you, I, in yeah. my industry, I see it all the time. Right. So some of my patients are musicians. Even though then you I'm know. Okay. So, yeah, I you know, I'm always encouraging them. And the same thing. I just see the two as being absolutely. Know, intrinsically intertwined because it's so important for our community, but for people right. in general. Right. And absolutely. then more importantly, I think music can be a medicine or at least a way to oh, help no pull question. people out of some of these challenges. Like you said, be it substance, be it self-esteem issues, Absolutely. which I think is often underlying. It. Absolutely. Um, even though they've got a very public image, mm -hmm. it's how do you feel inside? Do you really love yourself? So yeah. Yeah. I want the community's health to be a lot better, and I just think this is a great way to show it. It's wonderful, wonderful man. It's just wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. 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 Thank Definitely. you so much, man. Yeah, well, absolutely. We appreciate it. And I did promise that was the last one, but I wanted to touch base about the song that you made during COVID because just the way you recorded it was amazing. Um, I think the lyrics are still so vital, and I know it was written some time ago. Just tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Well, you know what? It goes back to our history. Uh, we've always been conscious about what's going on around us. If you remember, uh, this maybe before yeah, you were even born. Too, yeah. We had a record called Seems Like I Gotta Do Wrong yeah. Before They Noticed Me. You know mm -hmm. the tune. But how long when yeah. COVID hit and uh, we got to see people start dying, yeah. you know? And so once again, we said, now I remember back in the 60s, we were stuck. I know I lived in Watts and I had my problems with the police and so forth. Well, here we, let's fast forward to here it is in the 2000s well, and we're still so having the same problem. Yeah. So Magic Mendez, who's yeah. a bass player for us, 
came up with the song, he asked the question of how long? Mm -hmm. How long are we gonna have to continue to put up with this? You know, man, I mean, we saw- uh, George Floyd. George Floyd. That's really what started. The day that we saw that, that's yeah. really what started. That's what started we started we all. all happened to be, the good Lord made it possible, if right. you remember, for everybody to be at home to see that happen. On television. It affected us greatly, man. Yeah. So Magic called us with the song, and he said, man, this is the perfect question to ask. We had to, Lavelle lives in Vegas. We lived here, and we, that, at that time, we were wearing masks. Right. We told Lavelle, you gotta come to LA. He said, well, I'm not getting on the plane, I'll right. drive. Sure, sure. So we came, and we got in Scotty's garage in Northridge, and we right. were wearing masks, and we recorded that song, yeah. How Long? Yeah. And it meant the world to us, man. We couldn't wait to put it out. Sure. Well, it means the world to us. Not only continue to see you prolific, but promoting health, taking care of yourselves, still being active, and now finally getting the financial rewards you deserve for yeah, so yeah. many hits, exactly. so many decades. Exactly. Thank you so I much. I can't thank you enough for your time coming thank out you. and speaking to us, fitting us in. Thank you, my Thanks. brother. It's my Thanks pleasure. So much, sure. Thank pleasure. you. God bless you, man. Sure. God bless you. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. 